I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker for today, and that is Guy Royce. Guy works for Redis Labs as a developer advocate, combining his decades of experience in writing software with a passion for sharing what he has learned. Guy goes out into developer communities and helps others build great software. He lives in Columbus, Ohio with his wife, his three teenage sons, and a large collection of tabletop role-playing games. So now, without any further delay, I bring you Guy. Uh, just to prove that I actually do have a large collection of tabletop role-playing games, I have my 20-sided uh, uh, die. I, I predict my talk will last for 17 minutes. Yeah. 17 minutes. <laughs> no, that, well, that's completely wrong. I'm totally going to go over. Uh, <laughs> and you're joining us from Columbus. This is fascinating because I actually grew up. I spent four years of my early life in Cincinnati, Ohio, not very not far from there. So I've been to Cincinnati many times. So. Lovely. So now without any further delay, are you ready to share your uh, screen, Guy? Sure, I can do that. Okay, which one is it? I think it'll be screen two. There we go. The browser always wants the permission to share the screen, and then it, it, it says, uh, you know, and it just gives you screen one and screen two, and I'm like, which one's one and which one's two? I'm so confused. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, the stage is yours. Thank you, Guy. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, uh, welcome everyone to my uh, my little talk here, uh, Dungeons, Dragons, and Graph Databases. Um, this is uh, this is a fun little talk. Uh, I, I've already been introduced, but I do have a little introduction slide here. Um, and I'm going to hop over here so that I can see my slides. Um, uh, I'm, my name is Guy Royce. I'm a developer advocate at Redis Labs. Uh, if you haven't heard of Redis Labs, you've probably heard of Redis. Uh, one of the things that Redis Labs does is, uh, is we, uh, well, we sort of, uh, we, we fund the Redis that you've probably made use of before. Uh, on here, you can see how to reach me on social media and stuff. Uh, I always appreciate a follow on Twitter. Uh, and uh, if you want to get the code for this, you can find that at github.com slash Guy Royce. Uh, normally, I, I don't include my character sheets uh, with my uh, talks, but since this is a Dungeons and Dragons, the Dragons theme talk, I thought a character sheet would be appropriate here. Uh, I've got basic information here. Uh, you know, I've been doing the developer advocacy thing for about five years, so that makes me about level five. You know, I got my ability scores here. Please note the low intelligence and wisdom and the high charisma. So uh, that tells you everything you need to know about the talk you're about to see. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I like to say, uh, uh, people like to use the word expert. Um, they don't use it about me, but they like to use the word expert. And I hate the word expert um, and, and, and because of my low intelligence and wisdom. Because it says um, it says everything without saying anything at all. Uh, I'm not an expert in in anything really, uh, but I'm a fan of a lot of things. And one of the things I'm a fan of is Dungeons and Dragons. And another thing I'm a fan of is graph databases. And you know, as a Dungeons and Dragons player, I've got a problem. And and that problem is is that I need to go through the dungeon and level up my character. But to do that, you know, I need to find the best rooms that have the uh, the monsters that have the right level of experience that I can overcome. Uh, and uh, they can get me the most treasure so that I can uh, level up. So I can you know, get the uh, gold that I need to uh, buy more equipment uh, to be able to defeat more powerful monsters, to get the experience I need to uh, defeat more significant monsters. You know, that, that, that virtuous cycle of, uh, of leveling up that you have in uh, Dungeons and Dragons games like it. And I thought, you know, I'm a developer. I could just put this all in database and I could... Uh, do that using a relational database, which would be sort of the uh, the classic solution, the, uh, the the default solution, in many cases for people, um, with you know the tables and the columns and the uh, one to many relationships, or I could use a graph database uh, with uh, the nodes and the edges. And so what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to sort of compare and contrast how SQL works and how uh, relational databases work with how graph databases work with the assumption that you've probably used SQL before and you've probably used a relational database. Uh, but if you haven't touched a graph database, being able to see how you do parallel things in these uh, in a graph database will help you understand how graph works. Uh, this talk's an introduction to it. It's not a deep dive. I've got some really chunky, deep, beefy queries at the end, uh, which I'll, I'll touch on. Uh, but those are sort of touch points for you to go and learn more on your own. So. Um, so, but this, of course, all begs an important question, which is, what is a graph database, right? Is a graph database, um, 
how is it different from a regular database? And it's actually the wrong first question to ask. Uh, the first question to really ask here is, what's a graph? And a graph is, um, well, it's a mathematical thing, right? It's a, um, it's a, sorry, I'm, I'm having some technical problems here. Hang on. I'm trying to uh, see the chat and see my uh, slides at the same time and it's not working. So uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to, um, uh, organizers, feel free to just ask them on their behalf. I, I can't see the chat and my slides at the same time. So, um, so what is a graph? A graph is a series of nodes uh, connected by edges, right? Uh, and this 20-sided die is a node uh, connected by edges. You've got a, a vertex or a node uh, that represents the point here, like on, on my 20-sided die here. And you've got a, an edge, which is, well, the edge, right? It's the relationship between the vertices that make up the points of the this object. And uh, they, they don't have to just represent, you know, geometric shapes. They can represent all sorts of structures, uh, like family relationships, or you know, social networks, or logistics, or there, there's lots of lots of things they can represent. Lots of ideas, and a graph um, does that. That's what a graph does. The simplest graph is the null graph. Um, this is a graph with no nodes and no edges. Um, it's kind of boring. It's just fo uh, formless and void. There's nothing here. Uh, some mathematicians will say that a null graph is not a real graph. Uh, I feel like that's splitting hairs. Um, it's not a very useful graph. <laughs> um, so let's add some nodes to our null graph to make it a little interesting here. Now we've got some nodes. And so the gra these are just the nodes. The nodes do not have to have relationships to each other. They can just be points floating in space. Uh, and this is still a perfectly valid graph. Here we've got nodes A through F or A through G. And... Uh, this is a graph. It's not a super interesting one. It's more interesting than the null graph. Uh, let's do something that uh, when you hear graph, you might think of a little bit more and let's add some relationships. So uh, here we've added some relationships showing that uh, A is related to D, uh, C is connected to A, G is connected to C, stuff like that. Uh, but you'll notice that um, not everything is connected to everything. And so this means that this graph has portions that are uh, islands or they're isolated. So node E isn't connected to anyone, so it's isolated. Uh, node E is a subgraph of this larger graph. It's an isolated subgraph. Uh, these uh, two nodes over here are also a subgraph of this larger graph, and they're not connected to the entire graph, so they're also isolated. And in fact, uh, even the middle piece, which you'd sort of think of as the main part of the graph, is isolated as well because it's not connected to everything else. Um, let's go ahead and connect all our nodes together, and we'll create what's called a connected graph. So uh, this graph is connected because any node has a path either directly or through another node to another node on that graph. So the no node D is connected to node F by way of A and B or by way of A, C and B. Um, and so this creates a, a graph that's connected. I don't have a picture of one here. I, I should probably get a slide for this, but it, uh, where I talk about um, a fully connected graph. I, I always mention the fully connected graph, but I don't have a picture for it. A uh, fully connected graph is where every node is connected to every node directly. And you've seen these when, with those little, like like a like a, a star, you know, like a network graph that shows every node connecting to every node on that network. You've got the star with the little pentagon drawn around it. That's a fully connected graph of five nodes. And so once they're all connected, you can be fully connected. And uh, another thing about this graph that I've been sort of, sort of walking through here is that it's undirected. That means, uh, for lack of a better term, the relationships don't have a direction. There's no directionality to them. A and B are related, uh, but there's not anything more about that relationship we know. We don't know uh, if A is connected to B, but B isn't connected to A or anything like that. We just know that they are related. Uh, but you can make a directed graph by, uh, by adding little arrows to your pictures. <laughs> um, and a directed graph then means there's a there is a sense of direction in that relationship. And, and you might be wondering, what is that relationship, right? What's that direction mean? Well, um, I, I like to use the example of a, a mother and a child. Uh, there's a relationship between a mother and a child and the mother is, you know, mother gave birth to that child, that bore that child. And um, that has a direction to it. Um, the arrow says that the mother begat the child if the direct arrow was going the other way, that would mean something different, right? So that direction conveys an additional piece of information uh, that's reflected in this graph. 
Uh, graphs have degrees, or well, nodes on graphs have degrees. Uh, a degree is the number of relationships a node has. So node A has a degree of three. In a directed graph, uh, you can have an out degree and an in degree, which just means number of connections in, number of connections out. And, uh, you know, I've got kind of this neat, tidy graph that's on a two-dimensional surface here. Although, you know, this is a graph too, and it's not a two-dimensional surface, uh, this 20-sided die. It's a three-dimensional surface. I guess the manifold over it is is two dimensional. The surface there, but uh, but they don't. None of these rules actually have to matter. They don't have to conform to anything uh, flat or anything like that. Uh, they can you can really connect anything to anything. You can connect the same thing to uh, two nodes to each other multiple times, multiple ways. You can connect the node to itself. Uh, these relationships can be in all sorts of crazy configurations. And so that's sort of like graph theory super condensed in five minutes. Uh, a graph database is when we lay data over top of this structure. So here uh, we've added some uh, some types. You know, th these nodes now represent uh, types within our dungeon, uh, the uh, rooms, uh, the monsters, and the treasure. And then those uh, nodes can have data associated with them as in addition to their type. So they can have uh, properties tagged onto them. So we'll see here on the top left, we've got uh, uh, Alice the Elf uh, with an ID of four and uh, challenge rating, you know, there's there's properties there for us to do. The rooms have names and IDs. The treasure has a gold piece value. So, and uh, the relationships themselves can also have uh, data laid over top of them. They can have a, a type that uh, says, uh, you know, this room leads to another room or this room contains a monster or this room contains a treasure. And so this is the data that we overlay it. And then we get something that actually can uh, do a fair, is a, is a fair representation of our dungeon. Uh, in a graph database, uh, you have these nodes and these relationships or these uh, vertices and these edges. I, I tend to use the words uh, inner, inner uh, whatever the word is for using a word in place of another word. Uh, <laughs> interchangeably, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, nodes uh, tend to represent items or things. I, I think of them as the nouns. Um, they have labels. Uh, they can have one or more labels. So a thing could be both a room and a chamber and maybe like a, a hall. You know, those, those could have different meanings. Um, and they have attributes on them to uh, store the data about them. And they can stand alone. They can just be out there points in space, uh, just like in a graph. Uh, they don't need a relationship. Uh, you know, uh, no man is an island, but, uh, you know, uh, nodes in a graph can be. So, um, and then you've got your relationships between those nodes. And they represent that connection between two nodes. They connect to two nodes and only two nodes. Um, and they have a type, uh, which, you know, is the type of relationship uh, such as contains or, you know, like on social media would be, you know, you know, a post likes, you know, someone, a user likes a post or a user likes a comment. Uh, they have a direction um, to say which direction they go. And they can also have attributes, although I tend not to use that feature. Uh, but most importantly, or, or very importantly, uh, they cannot exist without nodes to connect, which makes sense if you think about it, right? Two points determine a line. If you don't have two points, the line disappears. Uh, it's, it's the same idea with uh, with graph databases. If you delete a node, any relationships to it, and their associated data will go away. So uh, they also tend to read like a sentence. So uh, a transitive sentence specifically. So you'll have a, a subject, a transitive verb, and then a direct object. So the room contains a monster. And that directionality is sort of reflecting that same transitive sentence nature of it. So the room contains a monster. Uh, you uh, could actually flip the directionality here and make a sentence in the passive voice and say the uh, monster is contained by the room. Um, but as my English teacher told me, that is uh, uh, the passive voice is to be avoided uh, by zombies. So, um, so yeah, they tend to, to read like a sentence. So that's sort of the theory and the idea behind a graph database. Uh, let's get uh, past the theory and start looking into something real because we've still got that problem of finding the best monsters and the best gold. And we still have to decide whether we're going to solve that with, uh, uh, with a relational database or a graph database. So with a relational database, uh, when you uh, actually want to talk to this, you know, write some code, write a query to talk to a relational database, you use SQL. And I'm assuming you all know SQL, uh, but you got your selects and your, your tables and your where's to filter those results. And we use SQL. In um, graph databases, a popular language, uh, and one used by Redis Graph, is uh, the Cypher uh, 
query language. And uh, Cypher uh, uses these matchers and then can return nodes and uh, relationships uh, from that graph and properties within them. And um, the key bit to understand here, and we're going to go into this in, in much greater depth, is the um, the match piece here, uh, the, the matchers. So we've got these little matching things here, and the matchers look like uh, like uh, they look like ASCII art, right? Uh, you'll notice that we use parentheses uh, to represent nodes. And you'll notice in my diagrams, I'm using circles to represent nodes. And this is how you would represent graphs mathematically too. If you were drawing, you know, you're sketching that on a piece of paper or something, you would uh, use uh, something round, right? And so uh, this matches a room node and the uh, the red one matches a monster node. So that, that parenthesis suggests roundness, suggests the node. And then the uh, contains actually looks like an arrow, right? We've got a little dash here and we got a little dash greater than here. And then we got in square brackets, we have the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the name the, uh, of the type of that relationship. And so this ASCII text here looks kind of like the graph does. It's got an arrow, it's got the, the roundedness. So that's kind of, I, I think they're kind of beautiful in a way uh, in, in if they, uh, they convey a lot of meaning, but at the same time, they're also visual. And, um, this is this matching is the heart of uh, of all of these cipher queries. What you'll do is you'll walk over, you'll provide a matcher, and it will match that pattern in the entire graph. And, and anywhere that we find a room that contains a monster, this pattern would match that. And so that's how we match things. That's how we query things in a graph database using cipher. Let's do uh, some CRUD operations. We'll compare SQL to uh, uh, to graph uh, to to cipher. And so uh, if we were doing SQL and we wanted to create something, we would use an insert statement. Uh, the corresponding code in, uh, in, in, in Cypher would be to say create, um, and then you say create me a node. You know, we've got the parentheses there again. And we say assign that node to the variable R and give it a, a label of, of room. So now we're creating a, creating a room, right? We're creating a, a node with a label of room. And then uh, set some properties on it. So we use a little set keyword here. And then we reference that variable that we used earlier and said, make the ID one and make the name the statue room. So that's how we uh, create uh, nodes using uh, Cypher. If we want to read that back uh, from SQL, we would do a simple select. You know, this is the, the most common thing. This first thing you learn when you, you learn SQL is how to select records. To do it in Cypher, uh, we would use the match keyword. And here we're matching that, uh, this is a matcher. This is the thing I was talking about earlier. Uh, we're just matching a single node, uh, assigning it to R. And then um, we're uh, filtering uh, that with a where clause, just like we would with uh, SQL, uh, where we're saying uh, where the ID is one. So this gets us one node, you know, match all the nodes that are of a label room, filter it to give me just the one where the ID is one, and then return it. To uh, update a room, with SQL, we would uh, upgrade the statue room to a statue hall. It's, it's going to be much more fancy now. Um, and we're going to set, you know, where the ID is equal to one. To do that in Cypher, uh, again, we do a match and where. You know, this is find this thing in the graph. And then once we've found it, uh, instead of returning it, we're going to set the name to statue hall. Um, worth noting here is that um, we've got a schema here. We don't have a schema here. We could say set r dot is trapped and add a whole new property to these uh, this node as well. Uh, so we the updating also includes adding new uh, properties because it's schema list. So, uh, but again, this is that same pattern match where where we're finding a pattern and then we're doing something with it, returning it or modifying it. And then deletion is uh, again the same pattern where uh, we match uh, uh, match a particular room and then we say delete. And so instead of returning it or, or modifying it, we delete it. And that's how we can delete a node. Uh, worth noting here that um, I'm using this match where syntax, but you can actually do a match and put curly braces for the properties. And this is a, a JavaScript-like syntax where you got curly brace, property value, comma, property value, comma, property value, and it ands them all together. So this is another way that you can match those values. And uh, this works with creating as well. Uh, you don't have to use set. You can actually just create a node uh, that has the uh, particular values or properties on it that you want already. And note, we didn't assign it to a variable right there because we didn't need to. 
And um, here we go creating monsters, which is using the same syntax. And we're creating uh, treasure, which is using the same syntax. syntax. These, these slides are really just here because I'm a completionist. Uh, so here's what our relational database looks so far. We've got three tables with some rows. Our graph database, we've got a bunch of nodes floating out in space. Cool. Uh, let's uh, do something a little more interesting. Let's uh, put a monster in a room. So if we want to do this with SQL, then we need to alter our table. We need to add a foreign key to the monsters table so that we can create a relationship by using an update of that row by saying, you know, this monster is in room one, Alice the ogre, or Alice the elf is in room one, Bob the ogre is in room three. Uh, by the way, fun fact, uh, my grandparents' names were Alice and Bob. <laughs> so uh, my grandmother was kind of elfin, but my uh, grandfather was totally not an ogre. He was a wonderful old man. I, I miss him very much. Um, but um, yeah, so we've put the monsters in a room. So so how do we put a monster in a room with a cipher? Well, putting a monster in a room is just creating a relationship. And so uh, we can do matching and creating. So here uh, on our first line, we're matching a room with an ID of one and assigning it to a variable R. We're matching a monster with an ID of four and assigning it to the variable M. And then we can use those two values to create a relationship between those two nodes. And so we say R contains M. And that puts a monster in a room. And so you just have to create that relationship as a separate create command. If you know that you have a room and a monster and a contains relationship, and you want to do that all in one, you can actually say create, and you can smush, smush this all together. And I don't have a slide with that on there, but you can expand out this R to be the contents of colon room, ID, colon monster, this. Uh, but then you have to specify everything. And if they existed already, you would you would create new duplicate nodes. So, um, so matching on the two things you want and then creating the relationship is a very safe way to do this. Put a treasure in the room is the same pattern, add the foreign key. And again, we're uh, matching the room, matching the treasure and creating a relationship. So um, relational database so far, we've got uh, our three tables, but now we have a one to many relationship between them. Our graph database so far, uh, we now have rooms and we, we've got isolated portions of our graph here where it's each room and the things that are in it is a subgraph, an isolated subgraph. So we've got enough that we can do some interesting queries. So let's uh, let's do some munchkinning here. Uh, let's find the rooms with the uh, uh, the most treasure or the uh, the best monsters. So if we want to farm all the XP in SQL, we need to do a join. So we'll select from a table, and we'll select from two tables where the room ID is equal to the ID of the room. And this says you know we can, we can get a join. We merge those tables together, and then we can order it descending. So we get a list of uh, the highest XP uh, monster first, and then you know gives us a uh, gives us a shopping list. Uh, you know, go defeat the ogre first, and then go defeat the elf. If we want to do this uh, with uh, GraphQL, or not GraphQL, uh, I've been doing a lot of GraphQL stuff lately. Sorry, uh, with Cipher, <laughs> GraphQL and uh, and graph databases have nothing to do with each other. Um, we can say uh, do a match on our graph and return every node where there is a room that contains a monster and then assign the R room to R and the monster to M and then return uh, the ID and the name, you know, and return the specific properties on those uh, nodes and order it by uh, the XP. And so this creates a, uh, th this, this match walks that entire graph, finds everywhere there's a room monster contain relationship and gives us a big list. And then we just sort it. And we could also filter that list and say, give me a room that contains a monster where the monster has experience points of at least 300 or more. You could, you know, be more sophisticated than that. Uh, if we want to get all the gold, it's a very similar thing where um, we're going to match where the room contains treasure instead. And uh, we're just going to sort by the gold piece value instead. So cool. Uh, but so what? Uh, we haven't really done anything with graph that we can't do with uh, relational. Um, well, we got one more thing where it comes to putting uh, things in a room uh, or connecting rooms together. Sorry. When we connect a room to another room, this is a little more interesting. And this is where I think graph starts to shine. To do this in SQL, we need to create a new table and then create relationships uh, or entries in that table to show the relationship from a room to a room. So here we've got room one connecting to itself and room one connecting to room two. 
room one connecting to room three. And we do this with just insert statements into this connections table. In, in many ways, we're representing a graph in SQL here. But when it comes time to connect rooms to rooms in uh, with Cypher query, with Cypher, uh, it's actually no different than putting a monster in a room or putting a treasure in a room. We match the two rooms that we care about using uh, ma matchers here. And then we create a leads to relationship between them um, in, in the same way that we created a contains relationship for the treasure or for the monster. And so connecting the rooms and connecting uh, monsters and connecting treasures to each other is all exactly the same process in a graph database. Whereas in a relational database, you need to represent these things with uh, uh, specific tables. And so our relational database so far looks like this. Our graph database looks like this. This is looking sort of like what we came in with. And so now we can start doing some really interesting queries because we uh, now have relationships between uh, uh, the rooms. We can start doing pathing queries, and uh, we can, you know, start sa say find the path to the room with the most gold, or give me a list of rooms that are nearby that have particularly uh, potent monsters. And uh, the trick to doing this syntactically with a uh, cipher is this uh, little star right here. The star says. Don't just match a leads to relationship between two rooms. Match a room that leads to a room that leads to a room that leads to a room as many times as it takes to get to all the rooms without creating circular references, right? So don't don't go in. If you, obviously, you could see how this could turn to an infinite loop where I've just got a bunch of rooms in a circle. Then you, I could create a path that is infinitely long. Uh, it That won't break your database. It, it finds those. It catches those. But the star says, just give me all of those hops. and however many it takes. You can also narrow it down and say, I only want uh, hops that are uh, at, at least one, but no more than say three in this example. So you can use the syntax to say, give me things that are nearby or to limit how far out you want to look. Uh, and this will return all the nodes. This will match in that graph everything that's, every room is between one and three hops away. And so this lets us do queries like find nearby rooms, right? So here we've got a room uh, of an idea one, uh, so this is the room we're in, right? Leads to one or two away another room. So this will find rooms that are one or two hops away. It'll match anything that's from where I'm at to one or two hops away. And then return a list of them. Just return the ID and the name of nearby rooms. Uh, more usefully, we can get nearby rooms with uh, with lots of gold. Uh, so this would uh, say, give me the one that's got the most gold by lim doing an uh, a limit on it. Here we're matching a room that leads to a room that contains treasure. And then we can just sort by the treasure. Uh, here we can find the longest path through the dungeon. One of the cool things is, is you can uh, take the results of this match and assign it to a variable and then ask questions of it. So here I've got a variable P, which represents all the paths that I've matched on. And I can say, well, give me all the nodes that are in that path or give me the length of that path. And then I can find the longest path through the dungeon or the shortest. Uh, I could find the room with the biggest treasure using these uh, with clauses. So I can match um, uh, all treasure nodes and then use a max aggregation to give me the, the maximum value of treasure that's in, in all of the, the treasure room, treasure nodes. And then I can find rooms that contain treasure and look for ones where it matches that max gold piece value. So this lets me find the room with the biggest treasure. And I can even find, uh, combining all these together, I can find the uh, uh, max treasure. I can find the rooms that contain them and say that's my destination. And then I can take the room I'm in and find the room I want to go to using uh, where clauses here, uh, get the path, and then that'll give me all the paths from where I'm at to that room that has the most gold in it. I can sort that and limit that and then get a path to the uh, the room with the most gold. So I can I can highly optimize my dungeon crawl experience. So normally I do a demo, but I'm probably a little long on time here. Um, I could do, I'll do a real quick, uh, just to show you that this stuff really works here. I'll, I'll run one query uh, through uh, Redis Insight here. I've got some cheater uh, queries here. So let's do the shortest path to the most gold, which is by far the most sophisticated of them. And I'm going to go ahead and run this against a, a preloaded room that I've got, a dungeon I've got up on uh, Redis uh, Cloud. And uh, we run this query, and there is our uh, our dungeon. Uh, this is the shortest path. If I, if I look at this view, it's probably a little better. 
it shows me the shortest path is four nodes going from uh, node one, room one, room 13, room 14, and room two. So this totally works. Um, this is not vaporware. This is actual real stuff here. Uh, I can do a match and return n, and you can see the entire graph here. So this is the uh, entire graph that I generated with uh, with my code, which is, is out of GitHub, and you guys can look at that on your own uh, afterwards. Here I've got my randomly generated dungeon. I can click on them and get data about them. And so, you know, this is sort of what it looks like to sort of play with a little command line tool that lets you view, uh, well, not command line, but with a tool that lets you view uh, your graph. So um, some practical applications. Uh, Got social networks, uh, of course. That's sort of the, the classic example of a practical application. We've got genealogy, uh, which is sort of social networks cast a long time. Um, you've got uh, transportation networks. Uh, transportation grids are natural graphs. Uh, you know, the intersections could be the uh, the nodes, and then the streets could be the uh, the relationships, or maybe the other way around. Uh, logistic networks, where it's like this farm and the and this uh, warehouse and this uh, processing facility and this store. You can track where goods go through a logistics network. Um, and really, I think it, and for anything that's reasonably small domain model, a graph can be a good uh, candidate for lots of problems, even ones that you might traditionally use a relational database for, like uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, resources here. Um, you can um, Key ones here, uh, if you want to play with Redis Graph, you can go to redisgraph.io. It's got all the information on how to get running with it. Uh, um, the Cypher query language was developed by Neo4j, and so they've got a reference for it out there and at opencypher.org. And um, I've got a little blog post I, I wrote about some of this sort of stuff, too, on Redis Labs. Um, I would ask you to, uh, if you um, are curious about this more, uh, you can always get on our Redis Discord server, which is, uh, I, I actually am the admin for it, so I run it. So uh, I'm always on there, so ask me questions. And then we got free courses, and uh, I used a Redis Enterprise Cloud to actually run my graph queries. You can run it locally as well. And all this stuff can be gotten, including these slides, uh, by this little QR code here that will never give you up, nor let you down, nor run around, or uh, take you to a site that you wouldn't expect it to. Uh, it, it, it won't record you, I promise. Uh, but anyhow, that's uh, what I've got. Uh, thanks a lot. Hopefully I stayed under time, and uh, I can... I could take a question, I suppose, if uh, there's time. Thank you so much, Guy. That was quite insightful, and I feel like I've learned a lot. And um, yeah, uh, I think we can. We're ready to take some questions from the crowd. Um, I think we already had one question come in, and that is: When you say small domain model, does Graph or Redis hit scaling issues at some point? Um, uh, graph in general kind of does just because of the nature of it, uh, depending on how you represent the, the graph database, there is a upper bound to, um, depending how you do it, you can either end in, uh, uh, a space complexity that grows geometrically or a, uh, a, uh, time complexity that is o of, a lot of O of N operations, uh, which over time it, as it grows becomes a problem. Um, Redis graph, uh, uses, um, uh, graph blast uh, to, to do this and uses sparse matrices to store it. And so it, it actually can handle that better. Uh, so it's, it's fairly fast, but it, it does have limits too. Uh, but if you're doing, if you've got, you know, millions of nodes related to millions of nodes, it can handle that. So you could, you can still do some beefy graphs. Uh, I don't know if we could do the totality of Facebook, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, what can, right. Uh, um, but yeah, so there, um, uh, so if you've got really huge, problems. You know, I, I don't know if I would implement a policy management system for an insurance company in, in graph, <laughs> um, you know, so that might be a suitable domain, but you know, it, it actually is applicable to more than just sort of the classical analytical type of things that we tend to think of when we think of graph. So. Does Redis graph have the notion of indices? Like, can you uh, create um, an index for certain queries or is that not uh something it, that can be done. It, it, it does. And in fact, it actually uh, can use uh, Redis search to uh, do a full text search of uh, mm -hmm. uh, content within it as well. So you could say, give me all the nodes that contain, uh, you know, the word, you know, blue or something like that. Gotcha. And we had another interesting question. What are the downsides of graph databases? How's that they are not often as used as SQL or no SQL for that matter? Well, I, I think one of the downsides is, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, that there it's schemaless, and so uh, that's always a trade-off, right? And so the graph database doesn't have a schema. Your relational database will, 
Uh, depending on what you're doing, that might be more desirable. That's kind of true of programming languages too, right? Uh, so that's one trade-off. And uh, what was the, I missed the second half of the, um, oh, wow, why aren't they used as often as SQL or NoSQL? I, I think it's, it's. Um, I think there's two reasons, answers to that question. One is, is that they're just newer. Um, like um, they're, they're just not as established. Like SQL is, like uh, the Oracle client that he used to use to do basic queries against uh, Oracle when I first started coding was copyright, would show copyright 1979. So relational databases are old, right? We've been using them for a long time. So that's that's part of the reason, is just um, they're newer. Uh, but the other reason is uh, that um, I think up until recently, uh, treating them as an online database as opposed to an analytical database hasn't been real practical uh, because um, the algorithms weren't there. Um, Redis, Redis Graph uses Graph Blast, uh, which is a library for deal, dealing with sparse matrices specifically. And so that piece of technology, the, the graph blast, I think makes a uh, online graph database uh, viable. Uh, whereas before it tended to be more of an analytical thing where it's like, well, let's run a bunch of graph queries uh, over the night uh, and then figure out recommendations for friends on Facebook tomorrow. Right. <laughs> I see. I see. So it's like the OTLP use case uh, yeah. is, is something more of a recent sort of advancement. Yeah. Um, and uh, another interesting question that came up from uh, Damien was, do nodes of the same type have to have the same schema? No, they can, no. Okay. They can, they can be whatever they want. <clears throat> there aren't any rules there. So, so you can make something really messy if you wanted to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, one question that I had is, does Redis Graph support kind of like uh, geographical or geometric types for, you know, the kinds of like, uh, 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 you know, the kinds of queries that you can do with like a, a geospatial extension. Like I mean, like, like latitude, longitude, you know, find yeah. me the, you know, you know, find me all the Walmarts within 35 kilometers of my position. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think Walmarts are only miles away because I, I think they're only in the United States and Canada. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but regardless, um, I'm not sure. I think I haven't explored it. I, I can't say with... I, there's a part of me that wants to say yes because I think we have that capability, but it might not, it might not be out yet. Uh, <laughs> so I need to check. I can't. I don't. I don't know for certain on that one. Mm -hmm. so. All right. And uh, uh, we also had a comment from Dominic who said, "Fantastic talk." Uh, so joining That's him on that. That's the best question comment. of all. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, to sort of wrap this up. Uh, uh, how does sort of gra how do graph databases scale and how does that sort of fit in with the cap theorem? I, I guess that touches on the idea of consistency and so on, yeah, which you touched yeah. on. Yeah, um, I, I think the cap theorem thing is is orthogonal to uh, graph databases uh, in the sense that um, that's more about you know is is it is it can it tolerate a network partition? Uh, is it is it available and is it consistent? Uh, graph databases are going to have the same constraints that any other database are uh, has. In our case, uh, for Redis Graph specifically, um, it's it's going to do the same thing that Redis is going to do. So it's going to be available, and it's going to be uh, network partitions tolerable, but you uh, couldn't lose some consistency. Uh, I, I think in, in Redis specifically, uh, a Redis Graph specifically, a, a graph database is a key, and so that key is really only going to exist on one shard anyhow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so I think in, in, I suppose that technically means that it would be consistent, um, uh, and available, but not, um, consistent, but it, it would only be on one node. So if you had a network, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, anyhow, um, but yeah, it's all in one key. So. All right. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank you guy for presenting this, uh, lovely talk and, uh, Thanks. I hope to see you again soon. Cool. Well, thanks for having me.